Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, uh, we will, uh, we have seen uh, concepts of uh, optimal control and also seen concepts of uh, estimation, especially Kalman filter and some external Kalman filter and, and uncentered Kalman filter things like that. And uh, now we will migrate to a slightly advanced topic uh, in aerospace engineering of course, uh, which talks about integrated estimation guidance and control. That means, uh, all these concepts that are available bits and pieces, estimation itself, guidance itself and control itself, can we really talk some sort of uh, in a integrated fashion and then try to get some advantage out of it actually. So, the next couple of lectures I will talk about that uh, uh, at various levels and things like that and primarily these are uh, out of our own research actually. So, some of the references will be our own publications as well. Okay. Let us get started. So, this uh, this motivation and philosophy is like this. What you are interested is, is to fuse the estimation guidance and control loops at various levels and benefits arise because of the fact that integrated design approaches are capable of retaining and exploiting the synergy between various subsystems. So, ultimately it is it is finally one system. So, if you if you separate it out and then put estimation as a subsystem, guidance as a subsystem like that. And ultimately, everything has to act on the same system finally. And then, if you if you don't exploit the synergy between them, then uh, unnecessarily there are transient effects, there are uh, large delay effect, things like that. Actually, so can we kind of uh, suppress some of those by invoking some of these concepts? Actually, so the integrated design approaches proposed in literature can be broadly classified into two groups. Okay, and primarily it is uh, integrated guidance and control or integrated estimation and guidance. Uh, there are also concepts of integrated guidance control and estimation together and popularly it is uh, IEGC some people call and some people call as uh, IGC and E. Okay. So, integrated guidance control and estimation actually. So, depends. Anyway, so the concept is more important. So, let us uh, see what is going on here. So, typically when you and these are largely in the context of missile guidance whereas, uh, you can talk about other systems as well. Uh, we have actually ex experimented some of these concepts of IGC and things like that in in UAVs and all that, yeah, but here the primary focus will be on missiles actually. So, when you talk about missile guidance and control, you also need some information about target actually. So, that target information is typically captured either through radar or, or seeker. So, we have a some sort of a target estimation loop and this target estimation loop also talks about missile guidance position and things like that position and velocity vector. So, that the relative error between them this this uh, target and, and missile kind of gets estimated and all that actually and that is what it is fed to the guidance. Guidance gives some lateral command and things like that which eventually goes to the control. Control can have its own loops which are not putting in this block diagram. It can have two, three loops by itself then it will finally go to actuator. Actuator will give some command of fin deflection and fin deflection is something that couples with the missile aerodynamics and hence it orientation changes, its force moment changes and then it corrects its path actually. So, this is all what it happens. Okay. So, when somebody talks about estimation, uh, he typically ignores all the things inside this guidance control like uh, actually all that. When talk, somebody talks about guidance, he ignores everything else, control uh, similarly things like that actually. So, now the question is can the time lag between various loops be reduced because the moment you talk about loops after loops after loop, what happens is inner loops would be sufficiently faster than the outer loop. In other words, outer loop has to be sufficiently slower than the inner loop. So, purposefully if this one has some actuator bandwidth and all that, this control design what you are talking about has to be slower than that, guidance has to be even slower than that and estimator has to be even further slower than that actually in error closing sense basically that is it. Okay. So, the question here is uh, can we really, really not do some, some guidance and control together because if you see this the guidance is typically done based on point mass or, or kinematic level to some some extent whereas control design is typically done using this uh, the six drop uh, equations of motion actually now the question is if six drop equation of motion is used in control design in any way in any case then uh, six drop contains the position and velocity information also basically 
So, why you using a separate dynamics for guidance and then invoking some approximate dynamics and all that actually. So, that is probably not needed. That whole idea uh, if you try I mean people have thought about and then try to combine these two loops and then concepts of something called integrated guidance and control uh, starts appearing. Then some people think about well uh, we can also do this way we can combine estimator and guidance because guidance essentially talks about target information all the time. So, estimation and guidance why talking separately you can talk together. So, that that leads to this integrated estimation and guidance and some people talk about everything together I mean this estimation guidance control at different level fusing them together and that leads to this IEGC concept integrated estimation guidance and control. So, this IEG and IEGC we will see that in the subsequent lecture, but today we will talk about this fusion IEGC integrated guidance control and especially we will talk uh, the talk uh, tech, I mean method that uh, that uh, we have proposed recently called uh, what we call we are calling as partial integrated guidance and control. So, all right. So, this is uh, the topic of discussion today primarily because the, if you are interested in talking about I mean or, or learning about various things on IGC there are several literatures available. Obviously, it is not possible for me to discuss many of the concepts that is that has appeared. But if you are interested you can read yourself, but one of the concepts that uh, that has emanated from from our own lab uh, that is what we call as partial integrated guidance and control that is what I am going to talk in this lecture actually. The primary references of this are several conference papers that appeared in 2009 and interestingly appeared in, in sequentially May, June, July and August 2009 at various levels of various techniques and various issues addressed and things like that. And if you really are interested you can, I suggest that you can you can read some of these literatures for, for more detailed explanation and all that. We are also in the process of writing uh, some journal paper and all, but so far it has not uh, appeared anywhere actually. All right. So, out, outline of the uh, talk is something I mean the subsequent part of the, this lecture is something like this. We give a very brief overview of conventional guidance and control followed by philosophy of IGC design its merits and drawback at the philosophy level we will not go uh, uh, details inside actually. Then, then we will uh, switch over to this partial IGC concepts and then we will take a typical real life example of uh, endo, endo atmospheric interceptors uh, engaging against uh, ballistic missiles incoming ballistic missiles uh, and we are assuming that the ballistic missiles can take ballistic trajectory only they cannot go through this uh, typical uh, the spiral motions and things like that. Okay. But still I mean we assume that the target is uh, some sort of a ballistic re entry vehicle with very high speed and then we have some sort of endo atmospheric interceptor uh, where you can we want to intercept it before it uh, I mean before it comes ground actually. So, that is the type of problem. Then we will follow with some numerical case, numerical results, first is nominal case and we will also give some comparison with conventional design as well as uh, uh, IGC design actually and we will demonstrate that uh, this partial IGC happens to be uh, in some sense better than both actually. Okay. Then we will address some of these uh, practical difficulty issues, uh, information availability, then zero effort misbehavior, perturbations with respect to initial condition, computational time issue, implementation with seeker noise, robustness with respect to parameter inaccuracy all these things happens to be very practical issues uh, and unless uh, all these things are addressed sufficiently it is not really a very good design. So, we will see some of these behaviors uh, with respect to this then we will have some some concluding statements actually. All right. So, very quickly what is motivation and philosophy of partial IGC? This is a typical guidance scenario and some of these are very clear from the from the guidance lecture as well. So, we have a missile and we have a target, target going its own way and missile going is chasing that probably and then uh, this uh, missile uh, if you continue to go in this direction it may not it may miss the missile uh, sorry it may miss the target. So, what happens is there will be some sort of a direction correction and direction correction happens in such a way that the LOS vector does not rotate actually the typical 2D picture. And so, ultimately the LOS vector does not rotate and finally, it leads to this collision triangle sort of thing it is there will be slight path correction sort of thing here actually okay. Okay, so, that finally, this vector gets in a slightly different direction sort of thing depending on what target does and that is done typically through lift generation and lift by mass is uh, typically what is lateral acceleration. So, A m and A m when you when you apply this lateral acceleration this velocity vector gets a turning and this, this is what it happens. So, how this A m is generated typically is done through so this very simple looking uh, guidance laws which is n v m lambda dot proportional navigation uh, and there are several variations of that. 
Okay, there are something like true proportional navigation, pure proportional navigation, uh, then augmented proportional navigation, modified proportional navigation, things like that, various things are available. But the fundamental philosophy is like that, if either A m is perpendicular to V m or A m is perpendicular to V, I mean this LOS. Okay. Then if it is perpendicular to LOS, then it is something like V c, if it is perpendicular to V a, I mean velocity vector, it is V m. And there are again uh, discussions in the literature which one is better than over depending on the situation actually. Anyway, so this uh, this is a summary of this in a very conventional sense, but there are several issues uh, there. Uh, but once you generate this A m and if you go extend that to 3 D, then one will be in the in the z direction and the other one will be the y direction sort of thing actually. And remember uh, in the x direction in the velocity uh, in the velocity vector direction, typically you do not have a control action basically. So, we we have to live with that and that uh, that the engagement is SEO typically based on the time to go information actually. Yeah. Anyway, so this is this is what it is. Uh, so once once you generate this lateral acceleration, this is the guidance command generation part of it. Then there is one more loop which will take this guidance command and then convert it to equivalent body rate command actually. So that is what body rate command generation will happen. Then you go to the inner loop and it will okay, I'll take uh, this rotational dynamics. In other words, p dot q dot r dot equations and all that. And then I will uh, I will use those equations to generate this delta delta p delta v delta roll pitch and yaw basically. Then it will be fed to the through the actuator dynamics, and then finally it will be fed to the missile dynamics, and then it, the vehicle gets course correction basically. So what are the things here? First of all, it uh, it kind of exploits the inherent time scale separation property. That's the very good part of it because when the, when we talk about guidance, we really don't worry so much about the body attitude actually. Okay, the orientation of the body doesn't matter. Ultimately, what matters? is uh, taking the vehicle from point A to point B. So, in a point mass sense that is the guidance problem. In other words, very very precisely the guidance has to translate the CG of the vehicle to a desired location wherever target is actually. Okay, so, that is that kind of thing. So, we typically separate it out the body rate part and things like that. What happens is body rates are typically fast uh, fast dynamics whereas, uh, velocity vector level well as you that u dot v dot w dot that component level or even point mass dynamics level the equations are slow actually. Okay. In other words, takes uh, some time to evolve actually. So, this time scale separation property between faster and, uh, and slower dynamics are typically retained here which is very nice and that is why the tuning difficulties are typically not there and all that actually. So, easy mechanization with easy tuning also, relatively easy tuning, I will say that way. And but the, the drawback is overall design is non optimal, even if the subsystem becomes uh, optimal. And also, this uh, this limited coupling because of uh, this point mass here, six stop here, and things like that, the, because of this limited coupling, it le typically leads to large number of design iterations as well. Okay. So, this is the, the I mean the good part is it exploits the time scale separation property and hence uh, it gives a certain ad certain advantage including easy mechanization and what it has this this drawbacks actually. So, to, to, to address these drawbacks uh, I mean uh, let us understand what is going on here. So, we have this outer loop ok, the whatever we are talking about the outermost loop here guidance generation part of it. Then there is a body rate generation in other words this is let us say 1 can be assumed as guidance loop. And this uh, intermediate loop has to track this command. So, that means uh, 2 has to track this one. So, that is how it is. And 3 has to track 2. So, that uh, 3 has to be, uh, I mean, 3 has to go and merge with 2 basically. So, that is how ultimately 3 goes to this this reference command dotted line actually finally. Okay. So, that is how the, I mean, you can think of understanding basically. But what happens here? Uh, we just one uh, some observations before we move on. This, uh, this many classical missile guidance laws are uh, typically inspired from nature. And especially proportional navigation is is inspired from the so-called collision triangle concepts and things like that. Typically, geometrical behavior. Then, control theory based guidance laws are also there, but they typically uh, take uh, either kinematics or maximum some sort of a linearized dynamics and things like that. So, essentially, they are not very effective also. So, in my own view, and so uh, I mean, the, which is typically all uh, modern theory based uh, modern control theory and especially this nonlinear optimal control theory based on guidance laws are typically is a natural tool to obtain very effective missile guidance laws. The only constraint is probably this this computational difficulty that bug people for a long time can it be overcome actually. What about autopilot design part? Uh, again autopilot design parts are also based on typical classical control theory like root locus body plot um, PID control uh, I mean lead lag compensator things like that. 
and uh, typically these are based on linearized uh, CISO model, single input, single output model. So, essentially it, it takes a lot of effort and tuning to make it work. Okay. So, linear modern control theory based MIMO techniques are available and they are slowly gaining popularity as well. However, nonlinear control design approaches are also evolving and they are uh, typically not that much used because of lack of good robustness evaluation tools. They may have, I mean they, they may have robustness, but uh, evaluation since the tools are not there and so confidence level is not there to go there actually. Like that. But having said that, there are certain cases where the people have actually uh, ventured out and then implemented nonlinear control design also for the autopilot in, in real test flights actually. Okay. Yes, and then sometimes this nonlinear designs can be unnecessarily over conservative also. For example, the nonlinear H infinity control if you want to use, sometimes it may be too sluggish also. That is another reason why it is not uh, that popular. Having said that, if you address some of the concerns, then obviously the design can be very, very powerful actually. So, what is essentially the drawback, drawback of this conventional three loop guidance and control synthesis? First of all, there is not uh, too much of synergy between guidance and control. And in essentially, the, the guidance either completely ignores the vehicle dynamics or only accounts for a limited point mass dynamics. Okay. So, the dynamics happens at uh, 6 top level that to I mean assuming rigid, uh, rigid body and things like that, uh, it typically 6 top is capable of capturing many things that goes on into the vehicle dynamics, but uh, the guidance to completely ignores that or very limited sense in point mass sense only it will take, it will talk about that actually. Okay. Then uh, it essentially leads to large overall loop delay and essentially this is not very good in time critical applications that is uh, this, uh, my strong view actually. That means when time to go t go is small then uh, you, you do not have a luxury of having this uh, this long settling time actually. Okay, so, that we will demonstrate uh, in the next slide probably. So, sometimes the null and designs can become unnecessarily over conservative that I already talked, uh, but uh, anyway. So, the point is that it may result in uh, uh, large overall loop delay actually, okay. and that is uh, when T go is small, it is not acceptable. Okay. So, overall design approach is typically non-optimal and hence it requires a good amount of effort. And that means, it really requires a good amount of tuning effort to make it work uh, near optimal. I mean, you can talk optimal, but if you really want to work it uh, near optimal, then uh, you essentially need lot of tuning effort actually. So, for the, for this fact, uh, people have thought about putting them everything together, I, IGC sense and then tell, okay, what about just one loop? Because every information is contained, target information we have, initial information we have. So, simply just uh, do some math and then to generate this pin reflection directly basically. So, essentially it uh, leads to this, this line of thought that it uh, results in some ad big advantage, essentially synergy between guidance and control, optimal performance of the overall system because there is nothing called point mass equation anymore, everything happens at top level and there is essentially no lag between guidance and autopilot loop and hence, and hence we, we assume, I mean we expect some improvement in the missed distance as well. Okay. But, uh, but what happens here that, uh, that uh, I mean, so Advantage wise, it is energy between guidance and control and optimal performance, yes. What is the drawback? Drawback is in our own observation, it works, but it works only with small perturbation about collision triangle. Otherwise, the tuning becomes quite difficult actually. So, design tuning is difficult uh, because of the conflict in problem objective and control effectiveness. Okay. Problem objective is to translate the CG from point A to point B, which happens to be the target position. Whereas, the control effectiveness happens in the rotational dynamics because uh, what happens typically is uh, if you if you deflect a control surface, it is not the, it, there is a small delta force generation, but force generation is not important. What is important is uh, moment generation because of this delta f, there is a long moment arm and then long moment arm results in lot of uh, moment and hence the body gets rotated actually, which is typically ignored in the, in the point mass level, body orientation is ignored. So, the any amount of control, I mean any amount of uh, control surface deflection has to account uh, this body rates uh, explicitly actually. If it does not, then uh, it leads to a lot of tuning difficulties because uh, what happens is uh, your this delta p, delta q, delta r or, or delta r, delta p, delta y, they also appear in the velocity level equation u dot v dot w dot or v dot alpha dot beta dot either way. So, uh, if your objective is to translate the vehicle from point A to point B, then uh, implicitly in the design process, this fins and deflections get generated through the velocity level equations, which are not good actually. 
we have to go through the to the moment level equation then the tuning will become very easy actually so this is what is written here control attempts to alter the translational dynamics directly rather than through the rotational dynamics that's the whole observation there so this causes the rotational dynamics to overcorrect and hence the vehicle becomes unstable if you are not very careful about uh, about this uh, fin deflection sort of thing because what you are doing is typically it generates the fin deflection from a relatively lesser powerful component and then the deflection becomes more and if it becomes more the, then the rotational level its effect effectiveness is very high so it will rotate the vehicle further and then it will go to unstable instability and all that is okay. so those are the drawbacks so the motivation for partial igc is like this so in other words we want to retain the benefits of the igc but we want to overcome the drawback of it actually okay so the questions are like this can the inherent time scale separation property between translational and rotational dynamics be preserved and exploited we we want to keep this property and exploit that as well but the the problem the, the conflict between between problem objective and control effectiveness uh, has to be avoided okay. in other words the guidance correction must happen through the rotation of the vehicle and not through the translation actually so uh, the point here is the control authority is more effective in rotational dynamics then the translational translational dynamics and hence that's the, that's the requirement actually so let's understand this concept again so we have this uh, this guidance followed by body rate generation followed by fin deflection so guidance uh, takes a long time and let's say settling time of the guidance loop is typically here so problem objective is uh, done somewhere here in other words if your time availability is more than ts then probably this miss distance is very small that's not a problem so much actually but what happens is we don't want to look at those problem we want to look at those problems where tgo is very small especially when the the incoming ballistic missiles comes with a very high speed even though separation distance is let's say 30 km when a seeker looks i mean opens up and, and sees the target the 30 km distance is typically covered in in 3 4 5 seconds actually so uh, that becomes a small tgo problem really so then in those cases uh, i mean what happens here is we want to do something so that this outer loop is avoided okay so remember this uh, this uh, inner loop innermost loop is capable of following the second loop but the, the by design the second loop has become quite slower because it has to track the guidance loop that's the whole idea there now let's get out of this uh, let's this loop loop 1 or the guidance loop then directly talk about body rate generation can we do that if you do that probably this body rate generation can try to catch up this this commanded value very fast and hence this three will also catch up with that now that is what is reflected here so instead of having this kind of a picture we'll have something like this kind of a picture okay so essentially what has happened is initially uh, our uh, settling time was somewhere here but by doing this uh, we have uh, we have been able to kind of reduce the settling time that much actually okay so that means even if this even if it, let's say the uh, some small tigo problem the real tigo happens to be somewhere here okay then also we'll be able to do it because our our settling time has reduced uh, here and our tigo is more than settling time now so we'll be able to do the job actually so the idea is like this so we have this uh, guidance body rate fin deflection and all what you are telling here is take come out of the typical guidance loop and whatever is left out is what you are calling as partial igc design actually so it exploits the inherent time scale separation property and then it operates essentially in two loop not in really one loop but we want to operate it in two loops actually and uh, so the commanded body rates are generated in the outer loop okay, directly and then the, using those commanded body rates we generate the fin deflections in the inner loop that's the whole idea here so advantage is again uh, just to summarize but it's a new philosophy altogether and tries to kind of combine the advantage of igc and conventional design both a very minimal tuning requirement and that's a big fact actually in my view if you if you happen to see the igc community and things like that happen to talk to them most of the time the, the most of the designs have this tuning difficulty actually but uh, in pi igc you really don't have this tuning difficulty actually so very less computational time because that so that is something that we cannot uh, avoid and it has to have otherwise all these nice concepts are useless so what you are doing here is outer loop we are uh, proposing this uh, this mpsp or mpsc that what you have discussed before these two techniques uh, and then inner loop we are trying to use the, this dynamic inversion concept so this is a nonlinear control design approach okay so successfully verified for a large number of initial conditions for both interceptor and target as well 
and comparison between conventional three loop uh, and SDRE based one loop design is also there actually. So, essentially the conclusion turns out that partial IGC happens to be better than both, but instead of simply telling in, uh, in English words, we will also go through the some of the results and then see why, why it is happening. Again, the, these are the co concept that is, that is available in some of these references, you can, you can find more details on that actually. So, implementation of this partial IGC is typically done this way, remember body rate generation, okay, either MPSP or MPSC whatever we are talking about. Okay, then uh, the, this one uh, will have this uh, Q star and R star available actually. Okay. So, this Q star R star generation mechanism will give us this uh, desired body rates Q star and R star basically. Okay. And then what happens, uh, okay, to tell the little more story actually here, see whatever T go we, we get uh, from this PN law and things like that initial guess. Uh, essentially, the whole idea here is uh, to nullify the errors in the two channel to two axes and then stick to that uh, that zero error actually. So, very quickly I mean we will have we will have this uh, ok. Uh, in other words, if you if your T go is somewhere like this, your, your estimate can be somewhere here, but the real T go can be very close to that ok. So, during this period whatever period is left out, we can think of uh, implementing some DI based guidance thing there. And that is why it is written MPSP, DI, and all that. Up to here, it is it is MPSP. Any small time that is left over, that means error has gone to zero in two components. It needs to remain at zero for the remaining time. Okay, so the remaining part is typically done through DI. Details actually you can see that in the paper actually. Anyway, so that is that part of it actually. Okay. <coughs> so, but also remember we need to stabilize the roll rate because without roll rate stabilization things can go very bad because uh, seekers can cannot see the target, pin deflections, uh, resolution. In other words, what you are generating is delta, delta p, delta y, but ultimately any missiles have actually four deflections, four pins, delta 1, 2, 3, 4. So, there is some pin deflection, uh, I mean logic, where you generate this delta 1 to 4 uh, using these things and then recombine back and things like that. So, the details I am not showing here. But uh, this can be done in a good way provided the body rate is stabilized, that means no further body rate uh, is there or its body rate is very small, in that sense uh, it can be done. But typically roll rate is also a sensitive channel because your I x x, the, the moment of inertia I x x is very small uh, and the moment that gets generated is large actually. Okay. So, your p dot becomes uh, non-zero and it doubles very quickly. So, that means your body will start uh, rotating violently and things like that actually. In those situations, even though guidance is good and all, it no, nothing can be done actually. So, we really need a stabilized roll rate to do anything uh, like guidance and all that actually. So, that part is assured by assuming this uh, some some zeta variable where zeta dot is assumed to be p and then this uh, this variable is paired so that p dot can be computed and then uh, sorry p star can be computed and p star q star r star are now available at this loop actually. So, this p star q star r star can be can be utilized uh, and then directly you can get the fin deflection and then operate it actually that way. And remember the entire the guide I mean this body rate command generation can be thought about like as outer loop guidance sense. Uh, so, everywhere the full information is uh, is required that all the variable that goes into the six of equation has to be uh, fed back actually and this q1, q2, q3, q4 are typically quaternion components actually. Other applications as well uh, we have done collision evidence of uh, UAVs uh, and then you can also implement it so for formation flying of UAVs. So, similar concepts, different techniques and things like that. You can see some of this literature again if you are interested in more about the concept of partial IGC. The way it is implemented for this missile problem is, is different from these things, but still the concept remains very similar actually. Okay. Uh, and typically these are dynamic inversion based, here also, here also. Basically. There is nothing called MPSP, MPSC and all that that way. Anyway, coming back to this particular problem, this uh, partial IGC design for endoatmospheric interceptor for ballistic targets especially. So, let us see to move a little more on to that. So, there is a threat missile which is the launch somewhere and all that. This picture is uh, taken from internet, I do not know the website I have forgotten, but then it uh, is typically taken from internet. So, this is a threat missile which is uh, which is launched towards the target somewhere, but uh, this, this is the defending region basically. So, this is where typically the, uh, the defending missile has to be, has to be launched and before it intercepts, I mean before this uh, this threat missile comes down, it has to be intercepted uh, way above ground actually. 
and if such a logic operates for for this class of vehicle then it can also engage with the conventional targets like aircraft and things like that that way so this is the whole idea of uh, typical engagement scenario informations are given based on radar and then this vehicle itself will have a seeker towards the end and things like that what we are talking is the very last segment of the, so from here to here for the interceptor and probably some here to here for the target actually for that kind of thing so the challenges here is first of all very high speed targets that means very less engagement time the time availability is very short and also remember very high line of right, line of sight rate i mean that's the fundamental thing for any guidance no matter what technique you use actually if your line of sight uh, rate changes uh, i mean you have to really uh, react yourself very fast also basically so if your line of sight uh, rate is high because the vehicle is uh, let's say going in in some sort of a i mean cross plane sense you are engaging okay, remember this this picture if you see if it is going in some plane and you are engaging in some other plane actually okay so if that's if that kind of a situation happens then uh, anything that comes in a very high speed here okay it reflects in uh, in large los rate actually okay and that that generates a lot of difficulties but ultimately we want zero miss distance or very close to zero miss distance because uh, this incoming targets are also having very good uh, shielding for their own uh, weapon system and things like that so unless there is a direct hit or very close to there and the very good impact of that it, it, nothing happens there actually so Oh, we have to go there and then have so this zero miss distance finally basically okay. so that is why this pn loss and all are not very effective because when line of, uh, there is a singularity towards uh, towards end actually so that that becomes a major issue there and then there is a, a constraint of impact angle and aspect angle things like that so that also has to be accounted for uh, not only the engagement has to happen in a zero miss distance sense but uh, it has to happen in a particular angle sense actually so that uh, that can happen and the drawback is we have this lateral acceleration saturation because the dynamic pressure is less as you climb up and up and up okay once you have dynamic pressure level once the dynamic pressure level drops down the obviously this uh, this engagement has to happen in a i mean this uh, dif the difficulty comes of turning the vehicle actually this this the whole whole idea all right so little bit math here so this is the target uh, has its own axis and system and all this is your line of sight this is the vehicle or interceptor missile whatever we call it goes to to engage the target actually so it has its own axis system but uh, this entire formulation uh, i mean any guidance problem has a inertial axis frame also where you see the engagement actually okay so the vehicle has its own uh, body axis system it has a inertial axis frame and then what you are telling is the entire equation of motion is given in the in the fin frame which is typically rotated by 45 degrees about uh, its own body axis actually and that fin frame we are imagining one more fin frame sort of thing is uh, located at the initial inertial frame center that is just to have mathematical formulation of the problem actually okay so this is this is what you see inertially located fin frame actually okay that's what you are, are telling here okay the orientation keeps changing but the position doesn't change for this frame but this this one the both position and uh, orientation keeps changing actually now the equations of uh, motions are given like that uh, no approximations involved in any anywhere it is the complete full six top model so you have this u dot v dot w dot p dot q dot r dot dynamic level equations so these are quaternion components these are the gravity terms uh, all these g term or you see here these are disturbance terms uh, Okay, which are uh, which uh, which are typically to some extent it is, they are known, so there will be some degree of unknown quantities as well for that. And then, and then if you go back to this uh, uh, dynamic, I mean kinematic level, you have this quaternion components. And then we are not talking about position of the vehicle itself, but uh, relative position between uh, between the vehicle and the and the target. And this relative position is is seen in this rotating fin frame actually. Okay. and when you have uh, derivatives taken in a rotating frame then this omega cross r has term has to be accounted for and uh, in doing all that we will end up with something like this equation actually so this uh, these equations what you have six equations here four here and three here so 13 equations total but you will have we will also have a quaternion constraint equation which is like uh, q1 square plus q2 square plus q3 square plus q4 square is equal to 1 okay so that uh, that algebraic constraint will also act on it so that is where the com complete six top equation is uh, is given for this vehicle more on this rotating fin frame concept one can see in the by going to this reference actually okay. 
All right. So the target model is uh, is typically a point mass model because uh, no sensors are available as of now which can give the six dot level detailed clarity of target dynamics, which obviously is impossible to do as per its current technology concern. But you can certainly get the information at the at the point mass level, and typically that becomes sufficient actually. Okay. So this this point mass level equations you have three dynamic component and three uh, kinematic component. Remember everything happens in 3D actually. And also, there are some some assumptions about the target dynamics. First of all, we assume endo-atmospheric engagement. We assume ballistic entry. That means no lift, only drag is there. Then we have this gravity turn is accounted for. Okay, and then no internal into I mean no intentional uh, end or spiraling maneuvers actually. No no intentional or unintentional either way. Okay, so sometimes this uh, this spiraling maneuvers are unintentional also because of the physics of the problem. It happens that way. But uh, that's the reality. I mean, I agree with that. But this particular experiment, we have uh, we are proposing a new concept altogether. So we thought, okay, we'll propose it with respect to non-spiraling uh, targets. Uh, but it has its uh, its drag actually, which is a major component. Okay. So that uh, that is how it is it is defined actually. Okay. Anyway, so the philosophy of uh, this time scale separated uh, partial IGC is something like this. We have already talked about that. And then advantages, uh, we've already talked about that many things. Uh, but the outer loop, we are using this MPSP and or MPSC. The both of both the candidates and both the things we have discussed in detail in one of the previous lectures actually. Both the techniques. Okay. So advantages of using this technique in outer loop uh, turns out that it can it, uh, it actually has a hard constant formulation. That means one of the things that you are looking for zero miss distance. Is we we can aim for now because we have a technique which can do that. We have minimum control effort uh, uh, kind of formulation here. It also has the close form control update, so computational time is less, and essentially it can be implemented online. That's what we we strongly think actually. Okay. So compared to these two MPSC, SP and MPSC, then uh, this particular thing MPSC has a little more advantage that control smoothness is guaranteed by formulation. And computationally slightly more efficient than MPSP actually, so that is uh, that's what it is. Okay, so then outer loop design we have taken all these things U V W P K P. Remember Q and R are control variables here, so P happens to be a time varying uh, parameter sort of thing. So these I mean this these are the states that are considered considered in the outer loop, and these are the control that is assumed in the outer loop actually. Okay, so the output vector turns out to be like this. Remember this this is this is in the Framework of this this particular design. Now you need the state dynamics. You need output vector which has to go to some desired output value values and all that at the at t goes to t f. So these outputs are typically this is what it is. You have to have this y r m and z r m relative dynamics in the fin inertially located fin frame in the y and z direction. They have to go to zero, and relative velocity in the y and z direction should also go to zero. That's the formulation actually. Okay. So this technique also requires some sort of a guess history. So we thought of implementing a PN-based three-loop design and then took the guess history from there. So this design we talked about that before. We have a linear parameterization and then this constant equation. Detailed math is already discussed, so I don't have to talk about it here. But essentially, it is it is operating based on the same technique actually. Okay. So these are these are the desired vectors zero 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 zero. This is the Uh, the actual vehicle parameter. This is the desired vehicle parameter when t goes to t f actually. And we implemented everything with respect to a three-loop design based on uh, this modified P N law followed by dynamic inversion uh, control synthesis and all that. And that gives us a kind of a guess history to start with, and that also gives us a platform to compare our results with respect to those results actually. Okay. Then coming to the inner loop control, we have this uh, fin deflections and, and inner loop outputs are something like this. And uh, the formulation y y should goes to y star in the in the dynamic inversion sense. So we define this error and then enforce this error dynamics. Okay, where k is a diagonal uh, matrix with the diagonal entries being this one over tau sort of thing actually. And settling time, remember how small we have assumed. Settling time we have assumed as 0.4 seconds. Okay, so less than half a second, we want the settling time to happen in the inner loop actually. So the outer loop can close in something like three, four times of that. So around one and a half, two seconds time, we expect that things will be uh, uh, the error will go. So any any t time to go which is more than two seconds, probably we will be able to handle actually. Okay, so that is the whole idea here. Mm -hmm. 
All right. The control update equation is in closed form. Those of you do not know dynamic inversion, I encourage to see one of my lectures in the previous, I mean, the, the another parallel course on advanced control uh, in this uh, in this NPTEL program. And then you can see why this this dynamics are coming like this actually. So details also you can see in the in the papers actually that way. Some simulation results. Uh, this is what it is. Uh, we have this. Uh, the target coming in uh, see ballistic targets typically come in a straight line sense uh, because they know many were there, but the, the speed at various locations are different because drag is there actually. Okay. So, typically this use target is coming and missile is going and engaging here. So, you can picture really this is zero mystery sense actually, okay. Okay. but we, have, we will see the values also basically that way. Okay. Anyways, the, the roll rate and all you can see very, very soon they are stabilizing, okay. whatever initial condition some, I mean. So, remember the roll rate has to go to 0, that is what the roll, uh, roll rate stabilization has to happen, it is happening and whereas the pitch and yaw rates are typically generated from the guidance loop, that will not go to 0 because you really need to turn the vehicle to go towards the target actually. So, this is what the final solution is, okay. this is the desired pitch rate uh, and this is the desired yaw rate. Okay. Interestingly, it happened to be kind of straight line actually, very close to, I mean you can see this, uh, these are straight line actually. Uh, even if it is implemented in MPSP for a framework where you are not really enforcing any straight line equation basically. Okay. But anyway, so they can see that very quickly the inner loop tracks the desired dynamics and hence everything happens in a nice way. Remember settling time is 0.4 seconds, that is what you have assumed here. Okay, so, 0.4 seconds somewhere here actually, so it is happening there. Okay, then fin deflection sense also you can see they are very smooth, uh, they do not have this, this singularity issues and things like that. And also the bounds are typically plus minus 5 degrees which is very less and typically the bounds will be something like uh, uh, 20, 30 degrees reflection, but where, where whereas you are utilizing only about plus minus 5 degrees actually. In other words, the scaling becomes in uh, from T0 to Tf in such a way that the demand does not become very high towards the end which typically happens in a conventional design sense. You can see this, this is also comparison between uh, this conventional and, uh, and typical, um, I mean the parcel IGC that we are proposing. So, this is this, uh, I mean roll rate is not too much of a difference, but if you see pitch and your rate, that is where the guidance loop closes, closes in. You can see some saturation here, okay, and, and more important towards end actually, that is what will reflect, reflect in which distance actually. So, here we have purposefully bounded it to, to the 20 degree per second limit. And that is why it is it is stabilized there actually, okay. We are not allowing it. If you allow it, it will go lot higher than that actually. Okay, so that is avoided completely in this new formulation. An engagement with different initial condition, you can we have tried out for several, several cases. Uh, once you tune it, you just forget it, you just keep on changing the initial condition, run your program actually. So that is what is done here. You can see various initial conditions for the missiles, various initial condition for the target also, both in position as well as velocity distance. No matter what it is, it is able to engage the target actually. Okay. And this was a little frustration if you we have uh, actually implemented one IGC concept based on SDRE uh, and tried several things for a couple of months altogether, but no matter whatever we did, the, the, the final disappointing news is something like this. If the, in, if the initial error without doing anything happens to be around 55 meter, we are able to correct only up to 39, 40 meters actually. So, there is not too much of a gain that way. But again, this SDRE technique is a little bit funny technique, it depends on SDC and things like that. So, we do not claim too much into that. Uh, what we claim is uh, to the best of our ability and, and tuning, it, this is what the results that we got. And typically, if the design methodology is good, then it should not be based on designer's experience and things like that. So, that is what uh, a good method will, will demand actually, I mean will result in that basically. So, without claiming, to, I mean without uh, claiming too much, what we claim is in our best effort, if the miss distance is initial 0, zero effort means without doing anything is happens to be the order of 50, 60 meters, then some correction may happen, but this is nowhere close to what we really want actually. Okay. So, this uh, in our experience, this, this one loop IGC was a complete failure actually in, in some sense. You can see the numbers here, uh, see this conventional designs, uh, if you have this zero effort miss uh, without any corrections, if it happens to be out the order of 500, 600 kilometers like that, uh, 600 meters like that, half a kilometer, then no matter whether you, imp whether you implement this uh, this conventional IGC, we, uh, we, I mean conventional uh, guidance and uh, end control, three loop design, then also radio mesh distance very low. If you use our thing, time scale separated parcel IGC, this is also very low. Okay, but if you compare them very closely, these are these are lower than these values actually. Okay, 
whereas compared to the one loop IGC, these are 50 meters, 40 meters like that, then only it works. If you, if you happen, the, if initial conditions are such that the initial zero effort meets is of the order of this high, half a kilometer like that, it does not work. It, it does not, uh, I mean, correct the error at all actually. Anyway, so coming back to this, this is the, uh, if this happens uh, at least, then it, there is some correction. I mean, 55 become 39, 53 become 32, 27 becomes 11 like that, but nowhere close to what it, this is a less than 1 meter level accuracy, what you get it here actually, okay. So, that is the more important part of it. These are again comparison between conventional PIGC designs uh, in, in terms of fin deflection sense. And see the momentary deflections here are quite large, whereas the red line is smooth and, and small everywhere actually. Okay. So, essentially no chattering and no saturation and hence uh, we can think it, it has higher capability and all that actually. Now, coming to some, some real quick practical issues, uh, the, as I told in the beginning, there are, there are issues some like something like information availability, receiving so much information feedback, are they available or, or not. Then there are ZDM behavior, zero effort misbehavior, finally what happens there, then perturbation in initial conditions, computational time issue, implementation with seeker noise and robustness with parameter inaccuracy. So, this, uh, these questions are like that, you can, it is kind of put it in a, in a question framework sort of thing. So, the information availability issue sense, what is, what you are thinking is, okay, this you, all these things are required for, for implementing actually, okay. Now, the, the good thing is this UVW and quaternion components as well as position, these are all available from the INS system and INS system is typically very good. I mean, you do not really need a filter in the loop also for, for you can blindly rely on this information actually. Now, we also need this information, target position and target velocity vector direction and all that, that is typically available through some sort of a uh, seeker information, but also remember uh, seeker, anytime what we want this information, we would also uh, utilize some sort of a uh, filter design and typically that is done through Kalman filtering. So, that part you are not talking here. So, uh, remember we are fusing guidance and control, we are not touching the estimation loop. So, but typically these informations are also used in the, in whatever best possible way you are using for the conventional design, uh, probably same thing can be thought about to extract this information and then couple with that actually. What about ZDM behavior? Okay, if you see the conventional loop, it is very lot of chattering here initially at least. I mean, this is the real reason why, why you require lot of battery power consumption and things like that actually. Okay, your uh, delta dot requirements will re reflect in all sort of things. But anyway, so we will not go too much detail into that. Uh, what happens here is uh, if you if you deflect the fin deflection and, and do not do anything for the rest of the time, then you have some station and that you want to collect, keep collecting and then plot actually. Okay. If it happens to be smooth, then uh, the design is much better actually and you can see compared to the blue line, how, how better is the red line actually. All right. Now, what to do? What to do with the robustness part of it? Uh, there are some issues like uh, sensitivity with respect to the modeling or parameter inaccuracy, things like that. So, for that part, we propose that you can uh, incorporate this neuroadaptive design in the inner loop only, basically. Okay. So that means uh, this rotational dynamics uh, where you generate the fin deflection. If that that is done properly, then everything else will be taken care, and that is typically done through through this neuroadaptive design. And what is the philosophy there? We have this p dot q dot r dot or this, this, uh, uh, this y d dot sort of thing, this is the desired dynamics actually. And this dynamics can be thought about uh, without any perturbation, without any, any accuracy issues and all that. But the actual output dynamics is different, it has this, this disturbance term, like in other words, this gets generated from this parameter inaccuracy and things like that. And it happens to be a, a kind of a critical issue for any aerodynamically controlled vehicle. Because aerodynamic uh, is uh, some part of it, it will always be kind of tabulated data. Okay, and the confidence level will be fairly good, but you expect some 10-20 percent error all the time actually. Okay. So that is the part which will result in this dy, and also the, if you have some neglected dynamics and things like that, it also appears in the form like this. So the concept here is okay. We know these two. So the idea is, can we do something so that y will go to yd very quickly actually? Okay. So, this is not cannot be done directly because this part is not known. So, the whole idea is can we know it first and that knowing part has is typically done okay, through some neural network approximation. 
So, whatever you do not know here that one is uh, we attempt to do that using a neural network actually. And once you do that and there is uh, some sort of additional term for making it a kind of a completely observable dynamic sort of thing actually. So, then this term is helps us in, in having the smaller bounds and things like that also basically. And those of you are interested you can see this 2009 GNC paper, A double A GNC paper, then you can see more than that actually. The whole idea is once you put it here, this term is an approximation to the neural network and this additional term is there. This is not same as any, anything like this, but our objective lies here. So, typically it is done in two ways that y should go to y a and y a should go to y d, that is the design. Whereas, the objective lies that y should go to y d basically. So, the, but we, what we do is we, we force y to go to y a and then y a go to y d. Now, and then y a to y d is done directly get okay, that part, but y to y a is typically done through this this Lyapunov design and things like that actually. Okay. Details I will not say okay, it will uh, excite uh, different branch of mathematics altogether using Lyapunov theory and things like that. But having said that uh, this is the engagement scenario uh, with adaptive design with parameter inaccuracy of the vehicle sitting there uh, as part of the modeling actually. Now, you can see the difference here. And this is uh, there are three plots here. One is actual with nominal control. Okay, this is this is the one what you see nominal. So first is nominal control applied to the nominal plant. So this is the thick blue line what you see here. Where the if you don't do anything, don't do any adaptation and things like that, then uh, you'll operate simply based on feedback. That means your for feedback formula will be same, but your states will be coming from the actual state and things like that. Actually. But even then, uh, the, the the see the deviation actually. The requirement is somewhere there, but the actual happens to be far away from there and that is here here also, here it also. And because of that, there will be a heavy amount of penalty for the missed distance. However, if you put the adaptive control back into action, then what happens is, is this red line what you see here, okay, it is actually very close to the thick blue line. That means, you will feel as if nothing has happened actually. Uh, subject to the issue that okay, this D is, is approximated very quickly actually. Now, these are the perturbations that we have discussed, I mean any, these are the parameters that are that are affecting the vehicle dynamics greatly. So, we have taken some some nominal and then some minimum maximum value sense and things like that. And then you can see that okay, if the nominal design is degraded that earlier remember it was all sub meter level accuracy, okay, within 1 meter and all that. Now, if you have parameter inaccuracy like that, then the same thing will result in higher mist distance 30 meter, 40 meter like that actually. But if you put the adaptive control back into action, then it is again come back within 1 2 meters actually, okay, maximum 2.83 meters like that. Actually, okay. So, you can see the number difference and you can claim that very easily you can see that there is a substantial enhancement of robustness actually okay, in the missed distance sense directly. It is not that the vehicle is getting fragmented or it is roll rate is very high, it has gone uh, unstable and things like that. Even though it may operate in a little bit stable manner, it is going somewhere else not towards the target that is the whole, the whole difficulty actually. And we cannot afford to have 10 meter, 30 meter, 40 meter missed distance, if this problem does not allow that actually. We remember we have to have 0 missed distance or something which is very close to 0 actually. And also remember when it somebody calls 0 missed distance not physically 0. It is the between the suppose the, the relative radius of the target and the radius of the missile if you take them together anything that any number that comes below than that can be considered as zero mistake because it is then then it will result in physical heat actually. Okay. So, anything that is typically less than 1 meter or 2 meter probably depending on again target and missile radius and all that. So, we can think about it as a zero mistake distance less than 1 meter, but within 1 to 2 meter or 1 to 3 meter we can think or 3 around that figure you can think about something like near zero missed distance. So, that is that is what is happening here after you put the adaptive control back actually. Okay. Now, there is another issue that boxes is how to deal with the seeker noise uh, because ultimately no matter what EK I mean what Kalman filter EK, UK whatever you put uh, there will be some sort of residual error actually. It, there it is not never filter out I mean any filter does not uh, filter out the noise uh, totally basically. So, there will be some degree of uh, inaccuracy in the output of the filter and remember these are all predictive logics MPSP, MPSC and all that actually. So, any amount of velocity direction error sitting there will result in a lot of repercussions actually because if you if you are if you are aiming the, if you are uh, okay, let me picturally show that there is a target here your estimation tells there is something here, but if you have a small error in the angle there then it may come out to be something there. So, your vehicle will typically go towards that whereas, the target real target is somewhere here. 
okay so that is that is that is the difficulty if the if the real target is somewhere here okay where your guidance should be actually taking towards that not not towards the other one actually okay but as far as information content is there uh, it is go, it is telling that okay it is going towards that direction so obviously missile gets misguided actually in a way so how to handle that issue basically that way so then the idea here is uh, we have the we are what you are telling is okay prediction of the target trajectory uh, is done with seeker output averaging over a finite window actually i'll i'll demonstrate that in a picture actually you take a little bit finite window and then uh, kind of do some sort of averaging of whatever value you are getting over a period of time and then slide that period and then keep operating based on that actually okay also remember that towards the very end seeker data becomes very highly noisy and things like that because of several other issues like uh, glint noise and other things there we don't talk about that but towards very end of less than 1 second to go and things like that we really don't have to account for that we simply we, we propose that we can go based on only prediction mode actually which is still debatable in a way how far you can uh, you can tolerate how less you can tolerate that that becomes uh, still a kind of topic of research actually okay anyway coming to coming back to that this is what is done so finally remember 25 millisecond is what you assumed for the seeker update data so what you are telling is uh, first five data will simply observe will not react uh, the guidance correction will not happen will simply observe what the target is doing which direction it is going and when this this guidance loop closure happens tg we already have some at least some finite window data sampling actually some four five data or depending on what level of mechanism you want to do actually okay. so here we'll 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 have take some some t0 has given some information we'll project it to t4 T1 has given some information. We'll project it to T4. T2 has given something. We'll project again to T4, like T3 to T4, and T4 itself we have got some data. So everything that you are getting at T4, you can just try to kind of average it out. In this particular case, everything we laid up and then divided by five. Okay, then that will be a much better information compared to what information we have got only at T4. Now this this noise averaging is not happening otherwise actually. Okay. and then from t4 to, to some some finite window we will we'll keep accumulating so we, we that means up to here it is uh, let's say t0 to t4 then here when you go we will have this uh, five data one more data averaging then one more data we will accumulate accumulate so then after a while we cannot keep on accumulating because there will be too many data actually it also makes sense to kind of remember the most recent data rather than getting reacted to the uh, very data that appeared very far away so we don't want to do that uh, because recent data is supposed to be much more accurate and things like that so what you do here is there is a accumulation loop okay i mean there is a guidance closure loop where this is, this is where the missile just flies with open loop no guidance in action then further the, there will be some sort of accumulation accumulation averaging and all and missile will start reacting to that after that and after a while there is a finite window and that finite window will slide actually okay in other words once there is one more new data will come this the previous the, the last um, the very first data will be ignored actually the recent data will be kept and the very last data will be ignored and then the window will be sliding actually and then you do also the averaging okay then you take it that means uh, when you talk about t10 let's say then uh, what is happening here is t0 is projected to t10 in a prediction mode T1 is projected to T10, T2 is projected to T10 like that actually, and everything happens at T10 gets averaged out, everything add up and divide by 10. Okay. All right, so that becomes the target information, and based on that information, we we guide the missile actually. Okay. So this is all explained in 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 wordings and all that. Two types of averaging: first is open loop, then there is a closed loop, and then all these pictures will tell you. There will be open loop, there will be accumulated averaging up to t0 to t9, then there will be sliding averaging in operation, and this operation ceases a uh, little bit before the real t go basically, because towards the end what you observe is if, if the data has not been corrected by that time, then there is very very less time to do anything actually. So it doesn't uh, do very good job actually after that. so we will leave out a little bit time before tf uh, where we just simply operate on the prediction mode all right so this is what you see after doing this okay remember this is not a straight line anymore but this is a little bit jittering here and this is the information as seen by the seeker information actually remember the real target can go still in a straight line but what our seeker will keep on telling that something is like this actually But that doesn't matter. It still operates based on the information that we have. And towards the end, remember, from here to here, there is no 
further information actually with I mean we just um, operated based on the prediction mode. And in this kind of logic uh, the mist distance happens to be 0.3 meters uh, very small and then uh, uh, if you see this uh, averaging and all that uh, so the different values of the mist distance uh, okay these are various things uh, okay with the, we take various random cases and all and then average it out and see what happens in, in some sort of a Monte Carlo sense actually. So, you can see that the maximum mist distance that we observe, obtain is about 4 meters here which is very small. So, in conclusion sense uh, it is actually a partial IGC is some sort of a new philosophy. Uh, so essentially what happens here is the inherent time scale separation property between translational and rotational dynamics is exploited and hence it leads to better performance with lesser and smoother control effort actually. Okay, with minimum control effort a very small mist distance is obtained that means it uh, results some sort of a hit to kill capability of the vehicle. And in a way it uh, our claim is it happens to be better than both, better than both conventional design as well as uh, the one loop IGC designs actually. I also observe that ZDM plot is very well behaved and information required for implementations are available and successfully verified for different perturbation cases so without uh, any, any separate case to case tuning sense. And then uh, somebody thinks that okay uh, this MPSP, MPSP uh, C cannot be used as such then uh, because they still operates on iterations and all that uh, still you can have some sort of finite iteration operation and uh, that also we experimented with just one iteration at a time and it, the results were very good actually. So, essentially it leads to very less computational time as well ok. So, the summary is PIGC with the DI and uh, NNA in the inner loop uh, it, I mean this neuro adaptive in the inner loop it also gives us lot of robustness for parameter uncertainty and all that actually without compromising on the performance too much. So, again the references are like this when you are interested you can see some of the references and get, uh, get more details out of it actually that is all for this lecture thank you.